welcome to Gospels and Acts, GSA. Lovely to be here again. And tonight we are talking about the greatest discourse of Jesus. Number 2.3, the greatest discourse of Jesus. And tonight's objective is to introduce the Sermon on the Mount and to learn about the Beatitudes. So let's start off by asking the question, what is the greatest discourse of Jesus? So the Sermon on the Mount is one of the greatest discourses of Jesus, or many scholars say the greatest discourse or teaching of Jesus. Now, if you had to describe the Sermon on the Mount, how would you describe the Sermon on the Mount? Okay, a guideline to being a Christian, the walk of a Christian, yes. That's good. A concise summary of the ethical teachings of the entire Bible. So, as we start studying the Sermon on the Mount, and we look at it in, in the context of a concise summary of the ethical teachings of the Bible, we must understand that what we're going to be studying in the next few lectures is very critical. And even tonight you will see that how critical it is uh, to the Christian life and how it can actually change your life. I mean, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the promise is that if you hear the words and you apply it, you will be on the rock. And even if the storms come, they can't take your house down. So just that in itself makes me pay attention when I study the Sermon on the Mount because I'm thinking to myself what Jesus is going to say now in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is of critical importance. And it can really alter the course of my life and my destiny. That is why it's so important. Now, we want to look at two things and that is the context and the content now, the content, obviously, is the information in the sermon. The context. What does the word context mean? So, context means with the text. But if you do a subject called hermeneutics, you will learn the art and the science of biblical interpretation. We spoke about rules for Bible study in some of our previous lectures, but this just means that we should see the text in context with the situation. And it gives us a better, better understanding then. When you read it in context, then you get a better understanding. You can really misunderstand the Bible when you are not studying it in context. But in upcoming lectures, we will talk about that more and more and more, especially about the rules uh, for biblical interpretation, uh, which is very critical. And it also helps us to then really get the full value of God's word because we're looking at it and we're finding the author's original intent and the message that the Holy Spirit has for us for today. Uh, remember what we said, uh, we want to move from the observation phase to the interpretation phase, right through to the application phase, where we actually apply God's Word. Because that's when the Word becomes very powerful in our lives. The context is at the end of the fourth chapter of Matthew, we find Matthew's description of the context of this great teaching. We read that Jesus was healing sick people who had traveled great distances from many cities and several countries to be healed. So Jesus is at the foot of the mountain and all of these people followed him and, and he's healing all the sick. That's the context. And the context is further built by he was healing the multitudes but then he invited some of his disciples to meet him at a higher level of the hill as they were gradually rising up the mountain. Some of them went up with him. And in Mark 3.13, you will see that Jesus actually invited certain people and said, come with me. The crowd 
who was waiting for healing and waiting for solutions and who had all the problems were still below. And Jesus took these few men up and then the Sermon on the Mount starts. Now that is significant because if we look at it also, we can understand that Jesus was strategically taking these men after he actually demonstrated the ministry to them at the bottom. He now separates them and he takes them up and now he's starting the Sermon on the Mount. So that is the context. And what many call it is the first Christian retreat. So we've got these two groups. On the one side we've got where the problems are, where all the hassles are, all the hurt is, all the pain is. And on the other side we've got these who are now sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which we can say those on a higher level. And for us also we can understand that even as we face this world many times, we can get stuck at the bottom of the mountain. We can get stuck in the problems and not be able to actually hear what the Holy Spirit is saying in our hearts. It's one word from God that can change your life forever. But many people are never positioned to hear that word because they're entangled and they're stuck. They become totally engulfed with this world. One of the strategies of the enemy is to preoccupy us, to burn us out. And a lot of times he makes us make decisions and choices in our life that actually sets us up for disaster. And we're always at the bottom of the mountain. We can never go up and we can never receive from the Lord. And what you will find is the Christian life is based upon us being able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's why Romans says that those who are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, the eos, which talks about full sonship, stepping into full sonship. Full sonship talks about full authority. So you don't want to be at the bottom of the mountain. That's probably something that I saw as I was doing that study. Now as we study the Sermon on the Mount, we will talk about lots of things. We will talk about salt and light, and we will talk about anger and murder and lust and adultery and divorce and remarriage and a lot of things. We will get into those things, loving your enemy, giving to the needy, praying and fasting. We will also talk about treasure in heaven and not to worry and not to judge and to ask, seek and knock. And we will talk about the narrow gate and the false prophets and then ultimately the wise builder. So those things will be covered, but Tonight we want to talk about the Beatitudes, or some people call it the beautiful attitudes. Now, do you know what the Beatitudes are? So, as we said, Matthew 4, in verse 23, it says, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming uh, the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and every sickness among the people. And then it says in verse 25, a large crowd followed him from Galilee, uh, the Decapolis, De Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan. And then in verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then in verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now this section of scripture in Matthew chapter 5 from verse 3 through till verse 12 or some say 11 is known as the Beatitudes. Now before we get into the Beatitudes, uh, let's make some observations. Something interesting that you will see in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What does that scripture mean? According to Jesus, the way we see things can be the difference between a life filled with light and a life filled with darkness. This is sort of an overarching principle that Calvary put in the curriculum so that we can understand that as we study anything in the biblical text, we need to align our vision with God's vision, with the way God sees something. Even in your own life, if you cannot see God's promises, and you cannot see God's goodness, and you cannot maybe even have an attitude of gratitude, you will find that darkness enters in, and it actually blinds you. To everything in your life. I've had people come to me in counseling sessions and they said to me, My life is a mess. In Afrikaans, a gemors. There's nothing here for me and everything is just wrong. And they just gave me like 20 things that were wrong. It was like their vision was totally in darkness. And I would say to them, What are you holding that pen with? And they'll say, no, it's my hand. And I'll say, is your hand working? Yes. Oh, so you've got a hand. How did you get here? With my feet. Oh, so you've got feet. There are people on the planet today who don't have feet. How did you know where to go? No, I saw with my eyes. Oh, so you've got eyes. What would you pay for your hands or your feet or your eyes if I had to buy them from you? What, what, what are they worth to you? No... I would never sell them, not for a million rand. So, oh, you, you're saying you've got like a, at least a million rand in your hands and your feet and your eyes. So you're rich, you're wealthy. How are you breathing? What did you eat? Where did you sleep? But as human beings, we are constantly reminded of what we don't have, of what's wrong in our lives. And that is what the enemy tries to change our focus on because he wants us to move into darkness because as soon as we go dark we go negative we go pessimistic we cannot experience God's goodness and we cannot tap into God's miraculous power that he has for us but we need to shift ourselves sometimes it's not a feeling it's not an emotion it's not uh, something that just comes sporadically. You have to intentionally have an, an, an attitude of gratitude and just be thankful. And make a list of the things that you are happy f about, that you are thankful for, not just the things that you don't have. You know what I saw as well in, in business? When I was a young man, I was selling against five people. And the people with the bad attitudes had legitimate concerns about the company. They had legitimate problems, but their attitudes got them to a position of disfavor with the company. They actually obliterated their own careers because of their attitudes. And no amount of prayer, no amount of fasting, no amount of calling the pastor to pray can solve that problem. That is a me problem, not a you problem. There are certain things in your life that you have to take responsibility for and you have to 
solve that problem yourself. Not even God's going to solve it for you. And your attitude is your responsibility. If you have a bad attitude, it's your fault. You can always cite five things or ten things. Why? But the fact is you've allowed yourself to go into darkness and step out of light. So we ask the question, what are the B attitudes? I must admit, when I read them for many years as a young man, I thought it was like awkward, the words. An a awkward word play. I, I really didn't understand what I was reading. So the beautiful attitudes or the B attitudes. These are eight attitudes or virtues that profile the mindset of a disciple of Jesus. It's almost like the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know if you've ever seen it like that, but it's very interesting when you start studying them. Currently, we are uh, doing general observations. So we do an overview now, but we will still get into each of them individually. But if you look at it, the first four B attitudes are the coming attitudes. The mindset of a person who comes to God. Those four are the poor in spirit, the mourning, the meek, the hungry. So those first four are the coming attitudes. When you come to Christ, these are the things that are fashioned in your life. I don't want to get into the individual ones now, but for instance, poor in spirit. Coming to a place where you understand that without Him, I can do nothing. Coming to a place where you understand that if it's not for Him, there is no hope. Where you don't have self-confidence, but where you understand the value of surrender. The second four B attitudes are the going attitudes. The mindset of a person who is sent into the world by God. There we have the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, and ultimately those who uh, are persecuted. Through the scripture, there is a pattern that emerges when God is recruiting leaders for His work. Those leaders have what we might call a coming experience and a going experience. They have a meaningful coming to God before they can have a fruitful going for God. You have to have a meaningful coming to God before you can have a fruitful going for God. They are worshippers of God before they can become workers of God. So they are worshippers of God before they can become workers of God. And if we look at the Beatitudes and we, we look at the first four, we can see somebody who's coming. If we look at the second four, we can see somebody who's going because now he's operating in mercy with a pure heart as a peacemaker and walking in persecution because everybody that wants to live fruitful in the kingdom will live with some form of persecution. If you don't have persecution, then there's probably something wrong with you. The other aspect that I just want to mention is that talent can be developed in solitude. So you can sit and play your guitar and you can sit and sing and that can be developed just there on your own. But character must be developed in the stream of humanity or while we are in relationship with people. This is why the Lord exposes us to other people because we are the body of Christ with members functioning together. Iron is fashioning iron. And when somebody is hurting you, or when you feel hurt, when you feel offended, it is an indication 
of an area in your life where God requires you to grow. A lot of times when you have an elevated response or you're very angry or upset about something that somebody said or did or something is really irritating you, it is an indication of a problem within you. And God uses other people to help us to manifest our problems. Sometimes it will be your boss. Sometimes it will be your husband or your wife. Sometimes it will be your friend. Sometimes it will be your pastor. Sometimes it will be a, somebody in your family. But God will use others to rattle your cage to a point where something manifests. And you're thinking, why am I so angry now? It is because you are being fashioned in the stream of humanity. And your character is being developed and you are being prepared for what God has called you for. So then also we have these four metaphors that begins the application of the sermon. As we finish off with the Beatitudes, and we're still having a bit of an overview here, we see these metaphors saying that you are the light, you are the salt, you are a city on a hill, you are a candle, and you must not be snuffed out. So these four metaphors, they begin the application of the sermon, saying to us that when we understand the sermon, when we understand the Beatitudes, and we see how God wants to take us from the coming to the going, and develop us into spiritual, mature people, then we get to the point where we are actually now the salt, the light, the city on the hill, and the candle. And we are then affecting change in our community. And this is uh, where Christ-like character impacts this pagan culture. And the disciples are then the salt, they are the light, they are the city on the hill, because the Christ-like character is impacting the culture. It's not religion or pretension that's going to impact the culture. It's transformation that's going to impact the culture. That transformation takes place as Jesus is explaining here in the Beatitudes, saying that when you come to me, you, will, you have to be poor in spirit, you have to mourn, you have to be meek, and you have to hunger for me. As you hunger for me, you will start having this merciful attitude, this compassion rises up in your heart, and then you become pure in heart. Not because you're wonderful in the natural, but you are then living by the Spirit, and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So all of a sudden, this transformation's taken place. You've moved from that point of absolute surrender to the point where you are pure in heart, where you function as a peacemaker in the kingdom of God, and you have this consistent hunger for more of Jesus in every area. Now you've become the light, the salt, the city on the hill, the candle, and you are shining in your community. You're not trying to have an outreach. You're not planning an outreach. You're not thinking of ways to reach people or tricksy ways to try and persuade people of Jesus Christ. You've become Jesus in the sense of shining Jesus through your life. the radiance of Christ start manifesting through you, this is the plan. This is the pattern. Religion has tried to show us something different. Where you think Bible school is a place where you're going to learn, write the test, pass the test, get the credential, and then be qualified. But Bible school is actually about growing deeper in your relationship with Jesus, and then, all of a sudden, your calling explodes, and you become the light, the salt, the city on a hill, and the candle.
It's powerful when you get that. Because it means that your responsibility is to go up the mountain. Your responsibility is to hear what he says and to apply that in your life. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. We try to run this from our minds where we try and figure it out and we try and plan it and we try and think it out and we try and reason it out and we think that it's our ability and all of that that's going to do it. It's not. It's our availability that He's going to use. But He's going to take you on a journey. And many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been shocked at the things that has many times not worked out for you and you know, not worked out the way you thought it was going to work out. And, and all of a sudden you're confused about your plans and about what you're trying to do in, with your life. But it's this process of getting to that point where you are exactly where He wants you to be. Look at Peter's life. Peter thought that they were going to take over Jerusalem. He thought that Jesus was going to be crowned. I'm sure when Jesus walked in and they were singing Hosanna to the son of David, Peter was rejoicing. Jesus said to Peter, listen, I have to be handed over, I have to be crucified. And Peter said, that will never happen on my watch. That night where, when Jesus was arrested, Peter went, he took out a, a sword and he chopped off the high priest's servant's ear. He was ready to go into violent mode. Jesus put the ear back. He said, put your sword away. And then Peter went into a very confused stage because he thought to himself, how can we build up this following for three and a half years? And popularity is growing and growing and growing to the point where we walk in Jerusalem and the whole city of Jerusalem stops and everybody's shouting and singing and throwing palm branches. This is the pinnacle of the ministry and all of a sudden the whole thing flips around and Jesus is humiliated, spat upon, hit with sticks on his head, his beard is pulled out and Peter's standing here watching this. Why isn't he doing anything? Peter saw the miracles. He saw the way Jesus operated in signs, miracles, and wonders. But yeah, Jesus was allowing this to happen to him. And Peter didn't understand that. And it upset him to the point where he denied Jesus three times. He said, I don't, I don't know the man. I was never with him. After he had done that, Jesus looked at him. And when their eyes met, Peter wept bitterly and he ran away. And he went fishing and Jesus went to go get him again at the fishing water with another miraculous catch. And Jesus asked him, listen, are you going to look after my sheep and after my lambs? This is what you were called for. When they received the Holy Spirit, things shifted in his life. He got up on Pentecost, he preached that sermon. Thousands of people came to Christ that day and Peter was a different man. He was no longer denying Jesus. He was no longer unsure about what he was supposed to do. He was walking in the power of the Holy Spirit under the guidance of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had started guiding him because Peter was a broken man. Not that, not that you know, he wasn't ill, he wasn't sick, he wasn't dying of some disease. He was a broken man. He was broken because his ideas, his plans, his thoughts, his hopes, his inhibitions were all thrown away off the table. And he said, listen, I don't know anymore. How do we do this? What are we going to do here? While he still had a lot of ideas and a lot of plans, it didn't work. But when he said, listen, I have to surrender, he received the Holy Spirit. He started functioning in the power of the Spirit. Now he's no longer hitting one, missing one, saying let's build uh, tents for uh, Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration or 
you know, making all sorts of silly statements. He's no longer hitting one, missing one. You know, one minute he says, you know, you are Christ, you are the Christ. Jesus says, yeah, no, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then it, just in the next few verses he says, no, 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 you're not going to die. I'm not going to stop it. And Jesus says, Satan, go away. You know, he doesn't go from being an angel with revelation to Satan with demonic tongue. Yet he is solid because of the fact that it's no longer I that liveth, but it's Christ that liveth in me. So that's probably the essence of the Sermon on the Mount. If we think of this way we climb this mountain, uh, the mountain of the Beatitudes, we climb it from the bottom where we get to the bottom level of being poor in spirit where we know we can't do this. Then we, we walk to the morning and we will explain that and the meekness, we will talk about that, the hunger. And then as we go up the mountain and we sit at the feet of Jesus, we go to the point where we receive this compassion to be merciful pure in heart, a peacemaker, and we function amidst the persecution and the resistance that we have in the current culture that we experience. And apart from the splitting of the four, the four at the bottom and the four at the top of the Beatitudes, there's also the coupling of two, where the first two Beatitudes teaches the disciple to say, it's not a matter of what I can do, but of what He can do. Or without Him, I can do nothing. So the first two makes that statement. The second couplet brings this confession from the disciple. It's not a matter of what I want, but of what He wants. The third couplet represents this spiritual secret. It's not a matter of who or what I am, but of who and what He is. And the fourth couplet witnesses the result of these beatitudes and confesses. It was not a matter of what I did, but of what He did. So you get to that point where, like Moses, we spoke about Moses. You know, you have the, that season in your life when you think I'm somebody and then when you think I'm nobody and then when you think I'm somebody who is a nobody but that God can use as a somebody. God can still use me but you find that out in that humble place, in the place of, of humility. And again, it's, it's a difficult thing for us because we believe in the kingdom power. We believe in believer's authority. We are not saying that we are going to put ourselves under demonic oppression. We stand against every form of darkness. But what we are saying is that we need to be able to hear the Lord. Because there are times when God will use the things that we go through to teach us something. And where we are supposed to catch that message. And again... It's nothing to do with demonic things that happen because anything like sickness, disease or anything like that, I stand against that with everything that's within me. I don't accept that upon my life. But what I have experienced in my life many times is I have failed many times. But failure is such a harsh word for that experience because looking back at the things in my life that have gone wrong, where I made wrong choices, and where I learned some kind of a lesson, it was actually just a learning curve. And it also brings you to a point where you are better equipped for ministry. I'm not going to go through all the Beatitudes tonight, but I just want to mention, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This means to be humble and to recognize your own insufficiency. That is what it means. And we will elaborate on that in the following lecture. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn learn to have compassion and to minister to others. They recognize sin and suffering and are open to receiving Jesus. You see, when you've gone through something, you have a better understanding of other people's suffering in those areas. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And in our curriculum, it talks about a horse and its power under control. And that is being like a tamed horse. A horse has the power, but it's, it's power that's under control and that is meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Then also one that I like because this is something I think that is a great indication of spiritual health. When you become spiritually sick in a sense and you are on a bad trajectory in your life as far as your spiritual life is concerned, a great indication is the lack of hunger. When you, when you don't hunger anymore. You don't have a spiritual hunger anymore. We saw this in the church for probably 26 years. We could see people not having that hunger anymore and then starting to come to services or be involved in ministry less and less and less. And eventually a large portion of those people actually what you call backslid. They didn't serve the Lord anymore. And I don't know if they do serve the Lord today even. We have to develop and remain in the thirst for righteousness because then we step into fullness. Hunger brings fullness. Which means that if you have a spiritual hunger and you are constantly asking the Lord, seeking, knocking, and hungry for the Lord, you will find that the fullness of the kingdom starts manifesting in your life. But it comes via that hunger. And again, as we said, you can't move from being poor in spirit straight to hunger. Normally there's this progression that we suggest where, you know, you move through certain spiritual growth phases and stages. But understanding them and seeing this prelude to the sermon, now Jesus is going to give all these details now, he's just saying, listen, this is what Christianity looks like. He says, look at these attributes. And he says, this is what a Christian looks like. And then he says, once a Christian looks like that, you will see the city on the hill. You will see the light shining in the darkness. You will experience the salt and you will see the candlestick. But when a Christian doesn't look like that, when a Christian has not had a healthy spiritual growth process, you cannot see the light. You cannot experience the salt. And if you say, I'm in Bible school and I want to experience God's top and the best of God's abilities in, in ministry, I want to experience the cream of the crop in ministry. If, if you say that's what I want to experience, that is the narrow gate. It is to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And it happens on the top of the mountain. That is where it happens. I'm trying to think how to express that. But if you're in, in the military, if, if you're in the military and you are busy training for a specific war that's going to take place. 
the foundation of your training is going to be your physical abilities. Things that you are going to have to be able to do. Whether that is running, whether that is jumping, whether it's climbing over stuff, whether it is shooting, you're going to have to know certain things and you're going to have to be able to do certain things. But you're going to have to have a physical capacity to get to a certain mark, even, you, you know, because when you get deployed into the warfare zone, the enemy is not going to worry about how much you know. If you cannot apply what you know, you're not going to make it in the war. And it's similar in the spiritual life. A lot of people think that Bible school is about getting all the knowledge you can and knowing everything. But that is like being able to know exactly how a gun works. You can strip that gun in 10 seconds. You can put it together again. You, you can explain every aspect of that firearm. But when it comes to shooting the gun, you can't do it. Because you haven't practiced shooting the gun. Now I think when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, this is what we are saying. This is practical. Because now Jesus says, this is what the Christian looks like. And now I'm going to give you all the information. But that information is application. It is to walk that extra mile, to turn that extra cheek, to do what the word says. Because that is like learning how to securely shoot the gun. Because if you can't do that, if you can't apply that, then you're not going to be able to succeed in the warfare. So Bible school is about really going away here tonight and saying, Yo, you know, I want these attributes to shine. I want this character of Jesus Christ to shine through my life. And how do I get to that, to that point? I mean, knowing it's not enough. Doing it is what is then required. And as we study the Sermon on the Mount for the next few weeks, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to show us things in our lives where we have to physically take action. Because if we don't, those will be the weak areas in our life where the devil will steal, kill and destroy because those are the areas of disobedience. So we have to be obedient and hear what the Lord is saying in those areas.